your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine I'm Dave Grant, host of Let the Bible Speak. So I hope you'll get your Bible out so you can follow along with me today. Um, I'm shifting on my lesson plan. We've been studying encouragement and comfort and God will be there and God's promises for several weeks now based on the fact that many people are in dire straits. Um, there's no socializing. There's a lot of people out of work. And that's an understatement. Um, it just seems our lives have been turned upside down. So our lessons, I think, have been appropriate. But is there any responsibility we should be taking right now? In other words, we're holding people responsible for the decisions they've made. Governor Whitmer's getting a lot of grief. The president is getting a lot of grief. The Congress is getting a lot of grief. The, the, even the health officials are getting grief. And that is because as things get a little bit looser and we're a little bit more feeling safe, we, uh, we seem to be finding fault. And I want to talk today about the difficulty of making good decisions. And of course, because this is the Bible program, we want to look at the way God wants us to make decisions. How do we make godly decisions? And I think this is going to be a two-weeker. So uh, if you'd like notes to go along with the lesson, and then you can have that to you know, look at next week's lesson as well, um, I'd be happy to send you a copy. I can send it by mail. I can send it by email, um, just about any way that you want. So go on our webpage, letthebiblespeak.net, and if you would like a copy of the lesson, just email me or call me. Um, and throughout the program, you'll see my phone number on the screen. Now, I'm going to do things a little differently today. I'm going to take a, a break halfway through. I'm going to go about 14 minutes, and then I'm going to do the last part of the program after our short break. And during that break, you'll see the Bible courses that we offer free of charge. You'll see the Bible, the His Eternal Plan, and you'll have our address at the Church of Christ. So, when I take that break, I'm, I'm asking the producers to put those screens on so that you can actually get those items and nothing we have uh, do we charge for. They're made available to us so that we can pass that on to you. So let's get into this idea of our taking responsibility. Now, I think if you've been um, thinking the way God would think, and this is my opinion, you would be trying to do whatever's best for everyone. In other words, um, they're forcing uh, masks at Menards now. And of course, you know I go to Menards a lot. And so if you go in and you didn't bring a mask, um, they'll sell you one at the service desk for a dollar. Um, and some people are upset about that. But in fact, haven't we seen too many people die already? And it is the virus, and they've identified that. And you might have a conspiracy theory here, but I, I don't believe in that. I believe people have actually died and been buried or cremated. And I don't want to be part of that problem. So I've been wearing my mask everywhere I go. And every once in a while, I realize, whoops, I forgot it. And I run back to the car to get it. So the discontent with the decisions that have been made, I think if we study our responsibilities, we may realize we're not really perfect in making decisions either. Um, in the past, 
we've had men's retreats in Gwynn. Jim Larson, my co-host, has um, organized them and got speakers for them. And the man who wrote His Eternal Plan, Jerry Tallman, which I offer at the break, you'll see his uh, book. Um, I'll give you one free of charge if you'd like. Well, he was doing a men's retreat up front and personal in Gwynn. And my friend and an elder in our church in Escanaba, Jesse Huff, takes notes like crazy. And he took notes during Jerry's talk, and this was several years ago. And he sent them to me and says, maybe this would work on uh, in your bulletin or as an article. Well, it did, but I just can't let it go. It's too valuable to not share it with you. And I am at that point where I want to see, okay, so what are we doing to improve the situation? Are we making good decisions? So it's, you know, I'm not going to as much you know, comfort today, I'm, I'm actually going to ask you to maybe look at yourself and say, am I making good decisions? So here's, here's where we're going to go. Uh, back in 2017, we had a men's retreat and Jerry Tallman was the keynote speaker. This is from Jesse. One of his lessons was titled justice. Is it just do it? <laughs> I love that. Part of the lesson he called the 10 gates of approval questions that we should always ask ourselves when making a decision. And then he goes through, and, and I don't know where he got 11 out of 10, but he's got 11, and one of these is Jesse's personal point, because he said 10 gates of approval, and now we've got, uh, does the Bible say it's wrong? Will it be helpful with others, to others? Will it enslave me? Will it hurt my body? Will it hurt my mind? Is it good stewardship? Will it edify or build up others? Will it glorify God? Will it cause others to stumble? And would Jesus do it? Now we're going to look at those over a period of two or three weeks, but two weeks for sure. And um, I thank Jesse for, for taking such good notes and having this for me. This is wonderful because I think it's something we need to do right now. As a nation, as a Christian nation, as believers in Christ, we need to be making sure we're doing things the way God would want us to do them. So if you want to get your Bible out, um, Micah is a prophet from the Old Testament. And I did this a couple weeks ago. Let me see. It was back when Jim Larson and I did our special one-hour programs. Micah was referred to there, to love mercy. But I want to read that text again. And... If you have trouble with Micah finding it, because it's a small one, um, don't be uh, bothered by going to the table of contents, because that's what I'm going to do right now. Sometimes it's just a little bit harder to find things when you're actually on TV. 923 is the page number if you got the Bible from us. 923. And I want to look at Micah and then go over to... Um, Verse 6, here it is, uh, Micah 6, verse 8. But I want to set the stage for this, because I know a lot of times repetition is the best teacher. So if you remember this discussion, that's fine. It, it will just seed it even better, because this scripture has been on my mind now for quite some time. Israel has been unfaithful to God. They actually have perverted justice, they don't worship the way they should, they cheat each other, they don't help the poor. There's a lot of things going wrong in Israel. And God has been warning them through the prophets, Micah is one of those prophets, that they will be punished for that. But here's, here's the part I want to read. Uh, starting in verse 6, we're going to read through verse 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? 
And this is the answer that God wants Micah to give people of Israel. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So from that passage, Jerry went into a lesson. Justice. Is it right? Do it. And that's a lifestyle of doing good. Now, I believe respect for authorities is part of that godly lifestyle because we're told multiple times in the Bible to respect the authorities. So even when we don't agree with them, yes, because they only hope for a peaceable society is respect. Now, our elders kind of watch out for us in the church. They're our shepherds. They, they teach us, they help us grow, and they watch out for the, the wolves and the sheep. So when they have to make difficult decisions, such as the president and the governors have, do we respect their authority? Do we follow them and make their job easier? Or do we kind of buck at it and say, no, no, I don't like that? Well, I think nation, church, and family all need to learn that respect so that things work the way God wants them to work. Even when you don't agree, if you learn to be submissive of heart and not so bullheaded, we might actually have an opportunity to have a, a good, strong society. So I'm going to focus in now on verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, in my words, do justice means living in such a way that everyone is treated correctly and honestly and fairly. Justice is uh, making sure that things are done right. So if I have a lifestyle of always wanting to do what is right, well, then I'm doing justice. I'm going to treat people fairly. I'm going to respect people. And then loving kindness or loving mercy, well, that's the compassion that we need to have. And there has been ample opportunities in the last five or six weeks to, to show kindness and mercy to others. Um, someone, uh, and it, it's uh, the preacher and his wife from the North Delta Church of Christ, Richard and Sarah, they delivered some um, homemade masks for me. What a wonderful thought. And then a little while later, they, they sent some more for Bonnie and I because Bonnie goes to work every day and so she's got some so there are all kinds of opportunities to show your kindness to others. I was just one of many that they gave those masks to. They've been making them like crazy. And they go to nursing homes and hospitals and older people. And, and they've been making these masks and giving them away. And you've heard stories about this on TV. So loving mercy and practicing kindness is what God wants. You know, all the things that he listed there, burnt offerings, calves, a thousand, or even giving my firstborn. You know, you think about that, and God says, just relax. All I want you to do is what is right. <laughs> I love that. God simplifies things for us. And so we're going to look at, well, okay, how do we live justly? How do we live in such a way that people will be blessed? So, as we begin after the break, we're going to, in making decisions, we're going to say, does the Bible say it's wrong? And that's something we wouldn't want to do. And we're going to look at several passages of Scripture about whether or not the Bible says whatever is being done is right or wrong, making good decisions. So I'm going to take a break at this point. And don't forget, these Bible studies, Bibles, and the book by Jerry Tallman are all available free of charge. So you can... Jot down the uh, address and uh, let me know you need it. We're uh, going to be looking at, does the Bible say it's wrong? In our discussion of uh, how to make good decisions. 
So let's take a look at the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. John 12 and verse 48. And I'm going to actually add a little bit to that, but we're going to start in verse 48. Um, Jesus is preaching, and he's sharing the good news, but along with good news is a rejection of it as bad news. <laughs> so you can't get away from that. Um, so when Jesus speaks and says, this is how you please God, those who reject that word, of course, it's kind of bad news. But for those who accept that, it's very good news. Now, when I look at uh, Micah and his uh, statement, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God, if the people reject that message, then in fact, uh, it's bad news. But if they accept that, God is making things simple to understand. Just do what is right. And then it's very good news. Now, does the Bible say it's wrong? John twelve forty eight. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. And the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority. And this is Jesus talking. But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as a father has told me. Now, when I look at that, I realize, okay, so Jesus is being quite clear, just so they understand. I'm telling you what is right. If you follow my teachings, then you'll be pleasing to God. So, how does the Bible say it's wrong? Well, let's look at Jesus' teaching first and foremost. And then from his teaching is teaching by Jesus to his apostles. And that's written in all of the rest of the New Testament. So if we want to know what the Father wants from us, what does God require of us? Is to do what is right. And so we make good decisions on whether or not it's right or it's wrong. A lot of them are quite simple. You know, do not kill. That's, well, I guess it's simple until you get into the 21st century in the United States of America because they're killing babies through abortions every day. So I guess it does get muddy at times by people who have not been trained to follow God's word. God gave life. We're not the ones that should be taking it. Now that's a, another lesson for another day. But uh, so John 12, 48 says, Jesus' teaching is important. Now, I'm not going to read this other one, but Matthew chapter 7, right at the end of the chapter, 24, 25, 26, is about the wise man building his house on the rock and the storms of life will not knock it down. But the foolish man builds his house on the sand. And when the rains come and the storms come, the fall of the house is great. And Jesus said, be like the wise man and put my teachings into practice in your life and you will be on the rock that lasts forever. So Jesus did this kind of teaching all through his ministry. And then the apostles carried that on for the whole first century. And that's where we come from as believers in Christ today is that we follow or we let the Bible speak. We let Jesus teach us. So is it right or is it wrong is going to be our judge in the last day. Now, I'd also like to turn to Galatians chapter 5. This is in the New Testament. So from John, you just keep going toward the back. It goes John, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians. So it's not too far away. And just... Turn over there, and um, in Galatians chapter 5, which is toward the end of it, um, we're going to read a passage that will kind of, it, it seems like it's a no-brainer to me, but of course I've been doing this for a long time, 
And uh, I've read it so many times, it's quite clear to me. But he identifies what the sinful nature is, or um, the flesh. In the NIV, and I, I grew up reading the NIV, so the, the sinful nature was what I understood. But uh, in this particular passage, um, they call it the works of the flesh, which is going back to the original language a little bit. The flesh or the sinful nature is the same thing. Are you wanting to be a spiritual being or a flesh, earthly, physical being? I want to live forever with God. So I'm, I'm going to seek to do the things that are not of the flesh. Now, Verse 18 says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law, or under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Those are the obvious ones, aren't they? I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the bad news, isn't it? Well, what happens if I've done those things, but I don't want to do them anymore? Well, that's called repentance. That's called turning away from the, the bad things that we've identified are wrong and asking God to forgive us and being born again in baptism and rising to live a new life in which God's in charge. And you take your direction and your orders from the commander-in-chief, which is our creator. So when I look at that, I, I just want to identify what isn't right so that I know what not to do. And there's another passage very much like it, and it's in Romans 1. So if you go back just a few pages to Romans chapter 1, this is one of my uh, passages that I, I look at, that the frustration that God must feel when people who know what it is to do the right things do the wrong things. It's just got to burn him up. And he says in Romans chapter 1 that if we continue to persist in this disobedient lifestyle where we do what we know is wrong, at some point we cross a line in which we can't find, ourselves, find our way back. And God doesn't want that to happen, but we become so callous and so tough because of sin that we're not bothered by God anymore. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 1. That whole chapter is an excellent chapter. But let's take a look at verse 28 and following. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. So God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. In other words, you're headed for a debased mind by doing the evil things. God let them. God gave them up. That's, a, that's unfortunate, but what are you going to do? If somebody persists in their disobedience, and we all have experienced some form of that in our families where somebody just doesn't want to follow the rules, and at some point you've got to say, well, this is our home, and this is the rules we're going to follow. And you know what comes after that. So then in uh, verse 29, it says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. That's not right. Evil, covetousness, malice. Malice is planning to do something bad. Something evil. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice these things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. 
That is a tough passage of scripture, isn't it? If we persist in that kind of a lifestyle, we're actually not going to see the kingdom of God. And I would suggest to you, the whole purpose of this first point, does the Bible say it's wrong? We have two passages, and there's others, that clearly define the evil things that we need to avoid and get out of our lives and turn our lives over to God. In so doing, we can have the hope of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Um, I like the fact that it says, they not only do these things, but they approve of those who do them. That's an important point to end on, because if we don't say, I don't agree, I think that's wrong, then we, by default, are saying, well, I'm giving my approval by my silence, by my submission to that. So this is different than not submitting to the authorities that are in place. For instance, you may not like Governor Whitmer and her choices. Okay, that's a possibility. I mean, there's a lot of people. I was just standing in Menards at the entrance and a lot of people voiced their disapproval. Well, think about that. Um, you can disapprove of someone's decisions or the, what the decisions they make, but you're, you're not showing the respect for authorities as God has asked you to. Now, if someone is beating somebody up really bad right there at the entrance to Menards, and you don't show your disapproval for that or try to intervene in some way to help that person, then you're not showing mercy or kindness. And you're just, okay, well, if he wants to beat him up, I'll let him. Well, that's wrong. Do you see my point? You can't, you could say Governor Whitmer's wrong in her decisions. You could say that. But the key is, is it wrong? Because we make our own decisions too, and many times they are wrong. Why not show some respect for someone who has the responsibility to watch out for us? Ah. You know, if you're a Republican, you find fault with a Democratic governor quicker than a Democrat will. And you don't have to be a Republican or a Democrat to show respect for authorities. Thank you for being with me today. I hope this is a blessed week for you. God bless. Yeah.